Well, which do you think is more valuable? The tree that bears the fruit or the fruit that the tree bears? The cook who makes a dinner or the dinner that the cook made? A car that gets you to where you are going or the destination that the car brought you to? Logically, a tree is more important because without it, there would be no fruit. A cook is more important than a dinner because without the cook, there would be no dinner. And a car is more important because without it, you would not get to the destination. As we study Matthew 6, 24 through 34 this morning, these examples will be helpful for us to understand one aspect of what Jesus was truly teaching. Try and see if you can spot the connection. In Matthew 6, 24 through 25, Jesus said, No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? This word, therefore, means because of this, or consequently. So Jesus is tying not worrying about food, drink, and clothing into the previous statement about you cannot serve God and wealth. It means that his teaching about not worrying that we're going to look at this morning is based on what he had just said about the fact that you can't serve both God and wealth at the same time. This is a very big clue to something that Jesus is pointing at in these passages that goes beyond simply don't worry. If all he wanted to teach us was to live anxiety-free lives, he would not have tied these concepts together with that word, therefore, but he did. And so these verses also have to do with serving God instead of serving wealth, in addition to teaching us not to live in anxiety. Jesus tells us not to even worry about the three basic essentials of food, drink, or clothing. Now, does that mean that we should never prepare another meal for ourselves as we run around without any clothes on? No. Please, no. He simply means that we're not to focus all our attention and our thoughts and our lives on those things. We're to be seeking higher things. These necessities are required things, like breathing or sleeping, but they should happen in a similar way without us overthinking them or making them out to be bigger than they really are. Now, some people turn food, drink, and clothing into idols. And anyone with cable TV has most likely witnessed this. There are several channels devoted to food and several other channels devoted to fashion or clothing. So obviously, there are many people who focus on food and clothing incessantly, even though they have plenty of both. But on the other hand, and on the other end of the spectrum, there are also those who truly are in need of food and clothing because of their poverty, but even they are not consumed with worry over them, even compared to some wealthy Americans. The truth about food, drink, and clothing, though, is this. It all comes from God, and He is who we must serve, not those earthly things. The Creator is always greater than the creation. Jesus adds, not only are food, clothing, and shelter less important than God, they're less important than life. They support life, but they are of no value to a dead person, so they are less valuable than life. Life and its intrinsic value is what makes the necessities of life of any importance at all. So life is worth more than food, and the body is worth more than clothing. Imagine that you didn't have an iron. Would you want an ironing board? What if you didn't have a computer, but someone gave you some very expensive software? Without a way to use the software, 
it becomes of no value. That's why food and clothing are less important than life because life is what makes them necessary and valuable. Jesus was not only teaching us why we should not worry about these necessary things, he was teaching us how to prioritize them properly. God, who is the creator of life, comes first. Then the life that he has given follows. And finally, there is the necessities of life that flow from God's goodness to us. The creator always comes first, then others, then ourselves, and people always come before stuff. In Matthew 6, 26, Jesus adds, Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? If God feeds the birds, will he not feed you since you are made in his image? This again is a priority or value statement. God made us in his image, so we are more valuable than the birds, and he even feeds them. So how much more sure should we be then that he will provide for our needs? This does not mean that the bird can just sit in its nest and never go look for food, but it means that when it does go looking, God will provide for it. In the same way, we work with the skills that God has given us, and he supplies for our needs through those skills and opportunities for employment. God created everything. In all foods, no matter how much mankind has ruined them by modifying what he has made, ultimately came from God's creation. So he is providing it all, even the Twinkie. We may ruin his creation sometimes, like the Twinkie, but God still created it. Jesus asked us, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Uh, friends, this question simply points out that worrying is totally ineffective and futile. In a closely related note, thinking and praying to arrive at a plan and solve a problem is not ineffective and futile, but worrying is. We can use our God-given minds to process a situation, to seek the Lord in prayer and plan within certain boundaries. But being consumed by thoughts about something that we cannot currently solve, which is anxiety, is wrong. James 4, 13 through 15, explains the boundaries of planning by saying this. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. See, planning involves two big ingredients, knowledge and control. James makes it clear, we do not know what will happen tomorrow, so our knowledge is limited. Also, we don't have any real control over anything other than our will, which should always be submitted to God's will, so we should really say, if the Lord wills. God has the knowledge and God has the control. If he is truly our God, we will treat him like we should and submit to his will just like Jesus did. The fact that we cannot control our own height humbles us and allows us to see how we're really not in control of even our own bodies in every way that we might want to be. This question also leads us right back to seeing who is really in control? Our Heavenly Father. That is why praying is truly the effective way to deal with our worries. Because anxiety is simply focusing on the things that we are powerless to change. Instead of entrusting them to God in faith, knowing that He has the power to change them at just the right time. Everything Jesus has been teaching is driving us back to God and his heart. All through this chapter, 
He has taught us to give secretly before God, to pray secretly to God, and to fast secretly before God. To be focused on pleasing God and storing up treasure in heaven, and to trust God completely and even put him above our earthly needs. Truly, if God wanted to, he could make us taller, but no amount of worrying ever could. When you face a concern, ask God to help you determine if there's anything in your power that you can do with God's help to overcome that concern at that time. But if you cannot solve that problem yet, then give it to him in prayer and leave it with him until the opportunity to solve it comes along. In Matthew 6, 28a through 30, Jesus continues by saying, So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? The Lord points out that God clothes the lilies in great splendor, and he asks, will God not much more clothe you who are made in his image? Before Jesus used birds to point out that God feeds them, then Jesus went to a creation even lower than the birds that is gloriously arrayed to the grass of the field in all of its splendor. God truly provides for the plant, such as the lily, with beauty and glory and covering, let alone the beauty and majesty of birds. And these facts can provide us with great confidence that God will keep us modestly covered by his grace as we obey him in faith. In Philippians 4.19, Paul wrote, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. We can trust God to provide for our real needs as we obey his word and seek him in faith. In Matthew 6, 31 through 32, Jesus begins to give the prescription that flows from this lesson by saying, Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. The first part of this commandment from Jesus is do not worry about food, drink, or clothing. He adds that the Gentiles, meaning those who don't know God or trust in him, seek after all of these things. Those that don't really love God don't actually seek after God. Instead, they seek after the benefits of that God gives. They seek the creation rather than the creator. Countless Muslim men seek after a 72-member harem. Other people who claim to love God seek after earthly prosperity. And still others seek after an earthly kingdom for their nation or themselves. But this is not loving God. They are not truly loving God and seeking him. They are seeking after God's benefits. And we can be sure that God can see the difference. Have you ever seen, maybe as a kid, that someone who acted like your friend and hung out with you did so only because you had a pool or some other great thing? Growing up, we called it using someone. And normally, it was about a pool where I was from. God knows when someone is using him for his stuff compared to when someone loves him for who he is. So we should check our motivations so that we are sure to be seeking God in his interests above everything else for the right reasons. 
We can enjoy the good things that God provides, but they are nothing compared to him and who he is. Jesus is all that could ever truly fulfill us. And keeping that mindset keeps us from seeking or appreciating the gifts and kindness of God over God himself. One way of thinking comes from selfishness, but the other flows from real love. Jesus also said that God knows what we need. So don't be like those who have no faith in God, who only seek after earthly things. We can be heavenly minded as we obey God's word and heed Peter's advice to humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. God cares for us. He knows what we need, and he invites us to cast our cares upon him. What more could we need than this? This leads us to the second part of Christ's prescription and the most critical point of this part of his sermon. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. If we love God, we will seek his kingdom and desire his total reign on this earth and in our lives first. And we will also seek to walk with him in his righteousness by obeying his word. We have the Lord's awesome promise, which is, if you put God's kingdom and his righteousness first in a heavenly minded way, all these other things that you need will be given to you as you go about obeying him. This sets us free from the heavy fetters of earthly worries so that we can pursue the higher calling of focusing on God and seeking to serve him above all else. This is the focal point of all of these passages because if we are primarily concerned with food, drink, and clothing, we will ultimately serve those earthly necessities. But if we're primarily concerned with God, we will truly serve him above all else. Then he will bless us by meeting our needs, not satisfying our greed. Also, in his word, God tells us that he who does not work should not eat. So we work as unto the Lord in the strength that he provides. God commands us not to be lazy, so Jesus is not saying that we can simply take it easy all of the time, because this would not be seeking God's kingdom or his righteousness and obedience to his word. If we are in need of the necessity of life, we truly make our needs known to him with prayer and thanksgiving and fully trust as we live in obedience to his word, he will hear us and provide as he promised. Paul wrote this in Philippians 4, 6 saying, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now this does not mean God is our divine butler and we can only call on him to ask for things, but we trust him as our gracious heavenly father. And we not only ask for what we need, we also praise him for his goodness and enjoy our time with him. If the Israelites would have obeyed these principles, that generation that died in the wilderness would have made it into the promised land. God kept their sandals from wearing out. He fed them with manna and quail. He gave them water from the rock. And he promised them that after their difficult journey through the wilderness, if they followed him, they would live in a land of milk and honey where he would take care of them forever. If they would have kept their focus on him, and his promises, while living on the hope and provisions that he had given them, they would have made it, and the journey would have been much shorter and easier. But unfortunately, they kept walking by sight and not by faith in God, and they turned back to Egypt in their hearts. This is what Jesus is teaching against here. 
We do not live to serve the necessities of life. We live to serve the living God who created all things. And he will provide all that we need to serve him correctly as we focus on him in faith, hope, and love. In Matthew 6, 34, Jesus tops off this amazing teaching by saying, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. We are not to worry about the future either. Each day has enough trouble in itself to deal with, and we should not worry about our future needs. Many times when we are focused on the future, we neglect the present. We might get so concerned about some detail in the coming weeks that we totally destroy today. Faith is the solution to these issues of anxiety, and faith is best exercised in prayer, and sometimes by prayer with fasting. When we pray, we bring our concerns to God in faith like children that trust that he will answer our prayers in his timing and work all to the good to those that love him and are called according to his purpose. If he takes care of the birds and the flowers, of how much more value are we? We can trust that the God who made us knows what we need and we can ask him in faith for our true needs. This does not mean that we can claim to need a yacht. He will be sure to provide only our real needs, as in necessary, everyday, essential details for sustaining life. Food, water, and clothing, as Jesus talks about here, are real needs, and they are provided like fruits on the tree of God's provision. All of them, though, come from God ultimately, so he is much more important than the provisions itself. The Bible warns plainly against worshiping or seeking after the creation instead of worshiping and seeking after the creator. And that is so important. Without God, there would be no provision, no life, no food, no drink, and no us. The cook is more important than the meal. The car is more important than the destination. This makes God the ultimate source of every good thing and the only real thing to seek after and focus our minds on. So this passage is really also about idolatry. When we put the provisions that God supplies in a place higher than him in our minds, we thereby serve wealth instead of God, and we live like the Gentiles. That's why Jesus began by basing these passages about worrying by saying, we cannot serve God and wealth, therefore. If we are more worried about the needs of this passing life than we are about pleasing God, we are serving the things of this life. Jesus tells us, he who loves his life will lose it. But he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. When is the last time we were as concerned with pleasing God as we were with pleasing ourselves? What do we consider more important, food and clothes or serving God? And if we were faced with a choice of going hungry or stealing, which would we choose? Last week we learned about how important our eternal heavenly investments are and how all of our investments in earthly treasure are going to be burned up. And this week, Jesus is teaching us that God and his kingdom should really be the thing that we are seeking while relying on him in faith without anxiety over the things of this world. In our fleshly way of thinking, we believe that if we just had a little more in our bank accounts, we would be safer or happier. Friends, if you have a lot of money, what you worry about then is losing it. In our flesh, we desire to build bigger barns and hold plenty of food 
Then we could say to ourselves, eat, drink, and be merry. You will never run out. But then we would let our concern for earthly security overshadow our desire to be pleasing God in faith. Faith calls us to a different life, a life that follows Jesus and the word of God. Let's close by looking at the life of faith that we have been called to, which tells us to trust in God and put serving him at the top of our priority list. Hebrews 11.6 explains, Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Just as Jesus told us, we are to in faith seek first his kingdom and righteousness in faith, and he will reward us. And we are not the first to embark on this great journey of faith. Remember Noah. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. We must not forget Abraham. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place which he would receive as an inheritance and he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, with heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And we can also think of Moses, who recorded these great things in the Spirit. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked forward to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible, by faith he kept the Passover in the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch him. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. In the New Testament, we can see that by faith, the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say, that any of the things that he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each one as they had need. This is Christianity. This is what it means to follow Jesus in faith. Our forefathers in the faith did mighty things simply by trusting God completely in obedience while setting aside their earthly worries, and so can we in his unlimited strength. The only limit to what we can do in Jesus Christ is how much will we surrender to him in faith? Jesus has already defeated our anxieties and worries on that cross. We just need to trust him and wholly lean on God, seeking him in his kingdom with all of our hearts and with all of our minds and with all of our souls. We can join with those who went before us in changing the world through the power of God. This is the way to victory through faith. By the blood of Jesus Christ, he has united us to the Spirit and presented us to the Father, and we can boldly approach the throne of grace in prayer, laying our burdens down so that we can fully obey God without distraction from the concerns of this world by faith.